Hey guys, what is up and welcome to another Blender live stream. My name is Brandon Hicks and I am your host of the Orange Guild. And so uh, tonight we're gonna get into some really exciting things. Uh, but before we do, just wanna let everybody know if this is your first time joining us, super excited that you are here watching, whether you're on Twitch or YouTube or even Picarto. Uh, really happy to be sharing some of the uh, inside tips and workflows uh, for what I use for my 3D projects. So uh, this week's gonna be a little different. If you got the email this afternoon, uh, you're on the Orange Guild mailing list, you'll know kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, but I've been really hard at work the past few days working on um, the uh, sculpture we're gonna talk about tonight and then also a brand new ebook for you guys. And uh, with images and everything laid out, uh, this new ebook is uh, close to 40 pages and uh, it's jam-packed full of some amazing stuff. Everybody that's on the mailing list is gonna get that absolutely free. And so if you want that, all you have to do is head over to theorangeguild.com, sign up for the mailing list, and uh, it's on the front page, can't miss it. And uh, you'll be able to get that for free as soon as it is ready to go. Uh, all right, so this week we're gonna be talking about uh, the 3D illustration. Uh, I was planning on wrapping that up last month, but due to, you know, uh, streaming, you know, the, uh, the beginners week live stream and, uh, some other things that got in the way, uh, we're having to extend it sort of into this month, which is good. Cause you guys are going to get more, uh, you know, tutorials and things out of it like that. So tonight we're going to be picking up on the hand sculpted pipe that we've been talking about. I worked about 20 hours this weekend, polishing that up and getting it to a point where I feel like I can, uh, kind of show you guys a finished product. And then tonight we're going to get into some of those tips about how I accomplished that. And then maybe a little bit of retopo towards the end. Tomorrow we're going to jump into UV mapping, a little bit of tips and tricks for people that are absolutely beginning for UV mapping. And I know we've had some questions in the past about what that looks like, how that works. And so we're going to get into some tips about that sort of stuff and texturing in general, whether it's in Photoshop or in Substance. And then on Friday, we're going to have sort of a uh, mystery day where we get into some other cool stuff. So if you guys have any ideas for things that you would want to talk about either in 3D or even a little bit outside of 3D, maybe in concept art uh, or filmmaking or, you know, something that's kind of closely related to what we do, uh, let me know in the comments or in the chat and I'll be sure to kind of write that down. And uh, I'm hoping that maybe uh, every once in a while we can do some, some mix it up and do a little bit of off topic stuff that'll be fun for everybody. Uh, so uh, Lauren's asking, would the ebook be appropriate for a complete beginner? And yes, there's actually gonna be some incredible stuff in there. If you were just getting started, it's gonna be a gold mine of things that you need to learn and know. And uh, I wrote it for people just like you that are absolute beginners and trying to learn the software. Uh, but there's also a lot of stuff in there for intermediate to advanced people that um, is gonna provide you with some things you don't necessarily always think about when it comes to being a 3D artist. And I think we get so bogged down with settings and techniques and proper workflows uh, at a more advanced level that we start to forget about things a little bit outside of that um, 3D arena. And it's so important uh, as I go into the book a little bit uh, to, to kind of balance yourself out as an artist and learn how to level up your skills across the board instead of just doing it in modeling, texturing, you know, whatever you're working on. So uh, that book's gonna hit a little bit on that. And it lets me get on my soapbox a little bit and talk about some of those things that I'm passionate about. Uh, and so again, that's gonna be completely free to you guys. As long as you're on the mailing list, just sign up for it and you're good to go. Uh, okay, so let me switch over and show you where the pipe has ended up. And here we go. All right. Sorry, as always, desktop's a little messy, you gotta clean it up. Okay, so uh, my graphics card doesn't like me to be zoomed out with super high resolution um, you know, models like this. So you're, you can tell from the very top here, when it's all said and done in object mode, we've got you know about 20 million polys that we're dealing with, uh, 28 million if you're counting triangles, close to 29. So uh, this is with everything turned at full blast in the highest preview settings. And uh, with my full dynamic topology sculpts, you know, obviously turned on and everything. So I haven't retopped anything yet. And as I zoom in, you'll start to see, you know, it cleans up and there's more and more detail uh, as we kind of zoom around and 
Uh, you'll see some glitches, but that's uh, it doesn't look that way when it renders. It's just it's uh, part of the way the graphics card is trying to display this live. Uh, a little bit taxing for it to handle that many polys in one scene. But I uh, went in with some custom brushes, did some riveting on some of the metal work around here. Um, I got a little bit tiny in terms of, you know, maybe this is a little bit unrealistic if it was sculpted by hand. But, you know, I took some artistic liberty because it's my model and uh, I wanted it to really pop on screen in the final render. I also went in and sculpted a little uh, Captain Nemo here for battling this monster octopus. So if you can zoom in, you can see he's got a little expression and he's holding a big, you know, lance or a spear or something like that. And little coattails in the wind. Uh, and so he's attacking this giant octopus sea monster sort of thing. And uh, for the most part, I stuck to uh, pretty well, you know, laid out anatomy and things like that for the octopus. I wanted to make sure I got things looking pretty recognizable for an octopus sort of creature. But I took some liberties, uh, gave it some horns and stuff around the top of the head, which is kind of a little bit more interesting and kind of gives some more weight to the fictional aspect of this whole project. Uh, so yeah, so altogether, what I'm going to be showing you guys tonight is a little bit about how I created these tentacles for the octopus. They're not perfect, but they do their job for this scene. And especially since this is going to be added to our 3D illustration and we're going to be way out here, um, it's not going to be super important that it's, um, it's details are perfect close up, but I like that it stays kind of rugged and, uh, you know, isn't perfect everywhere. So that's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, and then you can see the pipe stem with all the little uh, wood grain and everything added into it. And so let me see if I can pull up a full screen render for you guys really quickly. And I wanted to kind of show you what this looks like when Cycles actually gets this going, uh, which is pretty cool. So along the way, as I'm sharing kind of what's going on, let me know if you have any questions as we get in here about this project. And I'll be happy to kind of talk about the breakdown and let you know what I did in an area if it's confusing. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is sort of the finalized render uh, where we're at right now. Worked a little bit more on the materials and uh, got in here and uh, did some cycles rendering for you guys. Uh, so this is kind of what it will look like finalized. We're going to go in after we retop of this and add some more texturing uh, and substance to kind of beat this thing up and stuff. Uh, but this is kind of where I'm going to leave it right now for the sculpt as far as that goes. So let's get into some techniques. Let's talk about how we did the um, the octopus tentacles here because I, I had an interesting workaround uh, for how I ended up creating this easily or more easily than it would be um, doing this by hand. Because if you just take a look at the sculpture and you see how many of these tentacles there are, and then they're all in different positions, they wrap around objects and you know they're all in different perspective and stuff like that. Trying to get perfect rows of tentacles lined up on these, um, if you were trying to do this by hand, would be very, very difficult. So uh, what I did basically was I created separate tentacles uh, with one brush uh, and I um, drew a straight line down each of these tentacles with the brush that I had set up. And then that let me kind of duplicate and position these as I needed to, but I used a special technique for that, which we'll get into. Uh, so let me kind of start a new scene and I'll show you a simple example of how this sort of worked. And then let's, uh, let's get into some other things. So I'm gonna start a new scene because trying to do this with this other uh, example here while I'm streaming is gonna, I just know, I know it's gonna crash. So I'm gonna show you on something else a little bit easier. But you remember we talked about creating the tentacles using curves. And so what I did for each of these basically <clears throat> was I started with a Bezier curve and uh, let's, turn off all of the distracting things. So all you're seeing is the curve here. And then you'll remember that we had um, all of these sort of set up so we could extrude points and wrap those around different sections. Remember you can scale these and it's just like something in Photoshop or Illustrator in terms of how you kind of create these. Uh, but what 
I basically ended up doing was I created eight of these for the tentacles and then I went into the curve settings and I increased the bevel depth, changed the fill to a full fill. And then you have to change the resolution here up a few uh, elements so that you get a more rounded out uh, tubular shape. And at this point, what I did was I went and I started playing with the thickness of the curve. So if we start here, you can see when we select some of these points, you're gonna get options uh, at the very top of your uh, properties panel over here. Some of these are related to how these curves are um, positioned and how they're shaped. So tilt will change um, the, the um, position of some of these, these uh, curves in terms of how they're twisted and things like that. And so I'm gonna zero that back out. Radius is what uh, I started playing with in terms of trying to define thickness. So at the very start of the octopus head, I had these, um, these thicker. So I turned this up quite a bit. And then at the end, I um, created a smaller scale on that radius. And then what you can do is if you uh, select everything and then you jump into your search menu, can search for a um, a command and try to remember the name of it to get smooth curve weight and you'll see that it doesn't have a keyboard shortcut which is why I would recommend searching for it uh, but when you do that it'll average the weight all the way down the curve and so let me make sure that's correct so I don't want to give you guys something that's not um, if you want to do this without having to go over to this menu, all you have to do is hit Alt S on the keyboard and that will uh, let you do it that way. And so let me, uh, so that's not the right command. Uh, so let's search radius instead. Yeah, smooth curve radius. There we go. And so that's what does it. Um, and so that way you only have to set two points, a beginning and an end, and then when you, um, select that command, it will automatically average all the way down to the smallest angle there, as you see. Uh, okay, so that's how I got the basic shape in place for these tentacles in terms of the thickness. And then what I did was I converted these to uh, polygon meshes. And so right now they're still curves. And what I wanted to do was um, convert this to a mesh. And so all you have to do is hit Alt-C and that will allow you to convert from a curve to a mesh here. So if we jump into edit mode, you can see this is around polygons. And um, because of the settings and our curve menu, we have a lot of uh, spans here. And since I was planning on using a subdivision surface modifier, this was too many sections. So I'm gonna undo that until we get back to the curve. And what controls this, if I switch into uh, wireframe mode, as you can see, as I lower these, we can uh, control how many spans there are there. And so I only needed like this many so that I could use a subsurf modifier that would smooth the rest of this out. And so once I set this to here, now I can convert this back to a mesh. And now we've got uh, the right number of subdivisions. And then when I go back and add a subsurf modifier, it's gonna smooth that back out for me as I do here. Uh, okay, so knowing that I was gonna do that, what I needed to do now was figure out a way to easily create these tentacles using sculpting techniques uh, because I didn't wanna have to model them. That would be a nightmare um, and it wouldn't let me, you know, in any way artistically control what was going on. And so the problem is they're already posed. They're already in a position that's hard to move them in. Uh, with curves, it wasn't that bad, but since we've converted them to meshes now, if we wanna get in here and play with these positions, even with proportional editing turned on, uh, it's, it's gonna be difficult to um, try to position these in a way with all of these you know, subdivisions and these loops in here. And so uh, what I wanted to do was find an easier way to kind of help myself out with that. And what I ended up doing was using something called shape keys. So uh, if you jump over into an object that you have selected, jump over into the, um, the data, the object data setting tab over here, you can look under the menu here that says shape keys. It's right next to your vertex colors, vertex groups that we've talked about in the past. 
uh, but right here is shape keys. And what shape keys are is they're a tool that allows you to record certain uh, states of your mesh and all the vertices and faces and edges and those positions that they're currently in. And so by using shape keys, we can record specific uh, states of the mesh at different points in time as we want to morph the mesh around. So let me just give you a quick example of what that looks like. So let's say that this is my um, post ops, uh, my post um, octopus tentacle right here. So if I add a shape key and I call this uh, post, the idea would be to create another shape key here. And then we want to jump into edit mode and we want to move these points around somewhere else. And so if I were to reposition this in some other way, like this in edit mode with the second key selected, uh, it's going to record that position. And so when I jump back into object mode, all I have to do to show this key is to turn the value up to one. And you can see what that does is it blends between the two shapes. And so if we um, select the first one and there's a couple of options down here, this one lets you always show the current shape key for this object. And so with that turned on, now when I switch between these two shape keys, it's going to give me a preview of what that looks like. So even if this is turned down all the way, because I have this little thumbtack icon turned on, it's gonna show me whatever pose I have selected here. And so this would be like a second pose here. Uh, and so what you can also do is turn on this option, which will uh, allow you to see the shape key in edit mode. And so if I'm in edit mode here and I have this turned on, then anything that I do here, you're gonna see uh, it update there as well. So that will be something that can kind of help you. These two options are, are good to kind of be familiar with. And so what I did with the pose is I unwrapped the tentacle and then that gave me a straight mesh to work on. And so really quickly, let me see if I can kind of get this going in a way that is easy to see. And so what I would start with is creating another shape key. And this one would be called something like straight. And then in edit mode, what I would do is maybe set this to something like 3D cursor for the pivot point, select uh, one of these spans, and then I would just go down the line and um, I'm not gonna use proportional editing or snapping or anything like that. But it should let me edit this into place. So it looks like because I have this uh, button turned on, it's not going to let me edit this in edit mode. So let's turn this back off. That should let me move around now. Okay. So now I can start straightening this and I don't have to get it perfect. I just have to get it straight enough that I can kind of see what I'm doing. And it was easier to sculpt with. And that's really the whole point here is just to kind of get it to a point where I can with one smooth stroke, with a brush, get the whole thing finished without having to sit here, you know, and, and rotate my view around and go around circles and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so obviously it took me longer to do this on a more complicated pose for some of these obstacle tentacles. Um, but this is an interesting way to solve this workflow issue is to use shape keys to your advantage. And there's probably a way to do this with them straight before you pose them. Um, but uh, I had already posed them in my particular example, so I uh, didn't have the luxury. But this is a, a good example of when you run up against something and you need to solve a problem, there's usually a way to do it. You just need to figure it out. Uh, and so once I have all of these loops selected and rotated back around where they need to go, sort of in a straight pattern, then we can kind of paint in edit mode. Uh, that's it. Now that we have this straightened back out, you can see that, again, switching between these poses is going to give me uh, the option to work on either one of these. And then it will remember anything that I do in sculpting mode when I repose this back to here. So if we jump into the straight pose here under the shape key, and then I jump into, uh, let's say, I jump into sculpt mode. Uh, I can make adjustments here and it will remember that. Now, one thing to be aware of is that 
um, it's going to have to have the same number of vertices as it originally did. And so that's uh, why we need to use the multi-res modifier instead of the subsurf in this case. Uh, and we can't use dynamic topology because that will change the number of edges as we go. So let's once again apply a uh, subsurf here and I'm gonna turn this up to something like five. And now when I jump into sculpt mode, I can actually pick uh, something that I wanna use here. And in this case, let's just go ahead and create the, uh, the tentacle shape. So if I jump into texture, uh, I can create a new one, call this tentacles, and let's jump over to our menu here. Jump into, let's see, directory that's sort of close to where we need to be. Got our tentacles alpha here for the octopus tentacles. And then we need to play a little bit with um, what we're gonna use for putting this onto the mesh. So in this case, we might use a line and then we'll have to play with the spacing a little bit. Uh, but we can do something like this, start at the top, drag a straight line down to the bottom and then release. Now, again, we're gonna have to play with the spacing to get this kind of lined up appropriately. You can see what that's doing. And so at this point, we just need to lower the intensity here. Might play with the curve a little bit to be uh, kind of bulged out to the outside. And then try this again. Okay, so it's getting pretty close. I think I need to add a little bit more subdivision into the multi-res modifier. So let's subdivide this a couple of times. I think seven is about what I was at for the sculpture. And um, as long as your computer can handle it, you know, um, as far as the multi-res goes, then uh, I would say push it as far as you can uh, if you're sculpting details. And at this point, we're pretty much in a final state with these details. So that's what we're going for is a good way to get these lined up. So that's them showing up a little bit there. So now we have to play with the spacing in between so that those, uh, those lines kind of start disappearing. And so that's gonna come down to this. And I'm not exactly sure what I ended up doing uh, for spacing on the other one. It's not too far off from that. So let's play a little bit more. And I won't spend a lot of time doing this because it's not super important, but just wanted to give you guys an accurate example here of kind of what I did. And so once that is in place like that, all you really need to do is go back with smooth and kind of clean things up a little bit. And you remember that, you know, you've got a pretty large um, subdivision count here. So you're gonna have to turn your sculpting uh, your smoothing settings up higher so that it will still smooth those out for you. But that's all I did was I went back and I kind of corrected some of these areas that were a little too intense or going through the mesh on the other side. The tips tend to get a little crazy because um, it uh, it's harder for it to taper this down towards the end, especially if you use an automatic technique like a linear uh, line to draw those in. But that's all I kind of did. And so now what happens is when you switch back into object mode, you've got everything kind of lined up. This is stretched out straight and you want to uh, pose this back up. So all you have to do is switch back to the post that will rewrap this around for you into the proper pose. Remembering all the sculpting changes that you made, it will naturally distort things the way that it should on the surface of the mesh. And then again, while it's in this pose, you can jump back into sculpt mode. And now that everything is pretty much in place, you can continue to clean things up. And so now I can go in here on these areas that's looking a little crazy uh, and are having some, you know, some of the meshes going through the other side or uh, and all sorts of stuff is happening. I can jump in here when it's in its uh, pose and correct for all of those little things that are gonna pop up and kind of be in the wrong position. Um, but yeah, as long as you use a multi-res modifier instead of the dynamic topology, this method should work for you. And uh, it is a great way to quickly get things done. And I wish I had thought of it at the very beginning of the project because 
it would have saved me a couple of hours. Um, but I'm glad I found it anyways, so I could share it with you guys. Uh, but I actually use the same sort of technique on the uh, katana sword for my last 3D illustration uh, last summer. So this is a handy little technique to carry with you throughout a lot of stuff. Uh, so Lorian's asking, did I pose the tentacles after I attached them to the octopus? And no, I actually posed them um, with the curves before I created uh, the um, final version in the mesh form. And then I went ahead and I straightened these back out after they were converted to meshes, just like I showed you. So I had to go back through each one of these and straighten these back out. And so if I jump back into my scene over here, let me see if I can pull this up and show you kind of what this looks like without it crashing uh, and kind of show you the process a little bit. So I'm going to jump over to my backup layer. And this is where I keep all of my garbage in the scene. So if I screw up, I've always got something to come back to you uh, in case I mess something up. But you can see all of my base meshes here for things as I've gone through and gotten to critical steps in the process that I wanted to save. Uh, and so if I start hiding some stuff because there's quite a bit here, I can just show you the octopus. Uh, and so here we have the octopus sort of part of the body here, which I'll hide. And then we have these uh, octopus legs and there's actually duplicates of them sitting on top of each other. So if I jump into uh, edit mode on this, you'll see this one's still a curve. And so I can still pose this around, but the one under it is converted into a mesh. And so this has got a multi-res modifier on this. And these are actually all connected into one uh, giant um, object here that's been combined. And so if I invert the selection and hide the rest of everything here, so we just have the tentacles, uh, I combine them into one giant mesh because they were all going to be using the, the uh, multi-res modifier. So if I turn this up to seven, you'll be able to see all of the details um, without the pipe and everything. And here's all the tentacles and everything kind of posed in position. But if you jump over to the object properties, you can see I've still got these uh, shape keys live. So I have the basis, which is you know the posed version, and then I have the unwrapped version, uh, which if I click on that, it will switch all of these over into the original positions where I used uh, them to paint with. And so here is what I did to create um, all of the the tentacles in a single row. And so if I zoom out, you can see they're all lined up relatively straight, as straight as I could kind of get them without it taking me all day. And uh, then I could just jump into sort of a top view or a side view and then uh, stroke as I went. Now, one thing I did do on these that I didn't talk about was um, I would go sort of a quarter of the way down and then I would resize my brush. And so um, I can't show you because we're on sculpt mode and I'm not going to jump into sculpt mode because it may slow things down. Uh, but I would resize my brush for the tentacles a little smaller as I went. So this sort of tapers the size of these little suction cups as I get towards the tip. And that helps kind of maintain the illusion that I had spent a lot of time getting in here and mapping these out. You'll also notice that these tentacles are wildly different lengths, uh, which is not realistic, but you don't even really notice on the pipe. And so another good example of when you can take artistic liberties is uh, again, when, when if it's gonna be noticeable to the final viewer. And uh, in this case, it wasn't a big deal. So I didn't worry about it. One of the things I was trying to do with the, uh, the longest tentacle was set it up so that on the bottom of the pipe, it coils up a little bit and we have a way to sit this down on a flat surface, which is the way that I'm gonna justify putting this on the desktop for uh, the rest of our scene. So if I unhide the rest of the stuff, Jump back into our scene here and let's turn off mat caps. Then uh, we're going to end up putting the pipe somewhere around here and uh, it needs a way to sit flat on that desktop surface. So that's how we're going to be doing it. Uh, but yeah, all that stuff just kind of comes up as you kind of get in here and go through and uh, you know, you'll learn as you go. Uh, Lorian says it's discouraging her that I'm still learning and uh, it shouldn't it shouldn't discourage you i learn new stuff every day that's the only reason i can be out here uh kind of talking to you guys and teaching you is that i refuse to stop learning and uh you should do the same thing you should refuse to stop learning because there's always more to learn about everything 
Uh, so Lauren is asking, why did you not want to make all the tentacles the same length? So it wasn't a conscious decision. I started sculpting and I got into it. And what happens is uh, the more you add different lengths of um, the curved sections of these, uh, they will actually change the number of polygons that are added and you convert them to a mesh based on how far out you drag these. And you can't really tell that when you're um, using curves because I can drag this out as far as I want and it's just gonna just compensate. Uh, but when I convert that to a mesh, it's gonna add more rows in there to try to compensate for how far I've dragged out to the side. And so when it did that, um, I just realized as I was starting to unwrap these that they're, just, they're not all the same length. But again, you're never gonna be able to tell from a top view or even a side view unless you're looking um, specifically at this one, which again, you could kind of say was on purpose because we needed a way to justify um, having something to set this on the table. And I didn't want to put it in like a glass case or I didn't want to have a way to, uh, you know, put it on a holder or something like that. So I wanted to use something from the octopus to actually help that happen. And uh, that seemed like a good solution. So that's what we're going to go with. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about something about the multi-res modifier and how we would bake, which I think is going to be kind of useful for you guys. Uh, so we're going to use the pipe stem as an example tonight, and I'm not going to talk too much about UV mapping because we're going to get into that tomorrow some more. Uh, but I am going to have to UV map this to show you guys how this works. And I wanted to show you the workflow for how to use the multi-res modifier from beginning to end to bake out normals and do all of that. And so um, this is a different technique than you saw me do with the spoon, where we use dynamic topology like we did for the pipe or the octopus. Since we're using a multi-res modifier, we actually already have a low resolution version of the pipe um, because this is basically just uh, subdividing the mesh. And so all we have to do is duplicate a version of this. One is the low res, one is the high res, and then we've already got things saved and we don't have to retopo, which is a really nice feature of using the multi-res workflow. So you're limited on the amount of details you can add in without getting extremely high subdivision counts all over the whole mesh. But on the upside, you don't have to retopo, which is always everybody's least favorite step of this process. Uh, so let's talk about how we would do this. Uh, so I'm going to solo just this object right here, and then I'm going to duplicate this out to the side so you can kind of see what uh, I'm talking about here. So this one I'm going to turn back up to five for the full sculpted version so you can see all the details. And these are the exact same object. Uh, it's just that this one has the subdivision turned up all the way over here. So the way that this works is basically the low res version you lower it down the preview level to the number one or the lowest subdivision level. You could even go down to zero. I think it has to be at least one for the normal baking to work because of uh, it has to have at least one level of subdivision for this to happen. Uh, but basically set this to one and then you can say delete higher and it will get rid of all of the other subdivision levels on this object. And so now if we uh, were to apply this or even just jump into edit mode, you can see we're at this current subdivision level. And so now when uh, I apply this, it's going to finalize that at this current subdivision level. Uh, and I'm not gonna do that right now because I wanna be able to UV unwrap this with uh, one level lower than that. Uh, but we're gonna end up applying this. And then this one, we're gonna select this and we're gonna say um, apply base and so my understanding was yeah that's not the right that's not the right tool uh or the right uh, option there actually all we need to do on this one is just hit apply and it will uh, kind of finalize this mesh for us so now if we jump in edit mode you're going to see all of those sculpted details are finalized in the mesh and this is our uh our high res pipe so what I'm gonna do is reposition the origin to the center of this mesh, rename this um, pipe stem high. Then I'm gonna do the same thing on this mesh, reposition the origin in the middle, and I'm gonna name this pipe stem low. And so if we want to find these quickly in their giant list of stuff over here, all we have to do is have one of these selected. And then in the outliner, we just hit the period on our keyboard. 
And that's the same thing as hitting the period in your 3D viewport over here. And what that does is it refocuses your view around the object you have selected. So in the 3D viewport, it's the period on your numpad. And over here, you can use the um, you can use the numpad or you can use the period on your keyboard. It doesn't matter. But now you see we've got both of these named. And now we can start UV unwrapping uh, this one here. And let's get into baking after that. So I'm going to split my window. Let's save another version really quickly. You'll see when you get into sculpting with super high resolution and dynamic topology and stuff like that, and your poly counts are getting astronomical, your file sizes are getting astronomical too. Um, I am at, well, let's just see. Uh, for the blend file that I just saved, we were at over a gig and a half. And so every time you save one of those, it's uh, it's going to take up some memory on your on your computer. But just know that um, you know you need to back stuff up. That's the number one thing I would recommend is have a backup solution. I use Google Drive, and uh, you know make sure that you're you're got enough hard drive space to mess with the source stuff. Uh, so let's jump into edit mode and let's play with how we would need to UV unwrap this. So I'm going to deselect everything and we've got a pretty, um, you know, cylindrical object here. I'm not entirely sure if this is going to be an easy unwrap or not, but we do have separate meshes as well. And so the only thing I'm super concerned about is that we get sort of an undistorted layout so that when we bake the normals, it's not going to look crazy with the wrinkles and everything that we've sculpted in here. So I don't need to have the seams be perfectly straight or anything like that for painting purposes. I just need to have everything kind of, um, you know, in a way that is going to be undistorted. So what I'm going to do is add a seam on the bottom here because it's going to be an area we're not really going to see in our final render. I'm going to hit mark seam and then I'm going to do the same thing on these other objects here. So these are basically just uh, cylinders that have been kind of morphed into interesting uh, layouts. So I'm going to mark seams on all of these. And let's see what we get when we unwrap. OK, so we need some more seams on these here because we are not getting a split like we need. So let's select with L to see what we have here. So this one's clean. We're good there. Looks like these two are the ones that are going to need um, more splits there. And I'm not sure if that didn't go all the way through or what happened, but I can't really see this. So I'm going to hide the other stuff around it. So let's select this, hit H to hide that. I'm going to select this and hit H to hide that. And then let's go full screen take a look at this. Uh, so Lorian is asking, what does bake the normal mean? And I'll show you exactly what that means when we uh, get to the texture baking part. And that is the fun part where we get to save all the details from the high res sculpt to the low res version so that our computer doesn't try to blow up when we render. Um, so we got two objects here. They're not being split correctly. And it's because we also need uh, to add seams on the top section here. So let's hit Control E mark those seams, and now it's going to split those down the middle for us. And uh, I think we're still going to need a seam on the inside edge, but let's just see what happens. Yeah. So this effectively cuts them in half. I'm going to remove these. We need to have seams uh, running down just uh, the inside here. So if I hide one of these, so we're just looking at this. You can see we split this. So basically, if we just unwrap this now, we're going to have a big, long tube. But what we really need to have is a uh, split running down the direction this way. And uh, that's going to let us uh, kind of cut one end off and then have two separate pieces here that Blender can then flatten out for us. And I'm not really worried about the inside. So let's put the seam in here somewhere. And I don't even think we need this one. Uh, I think Blender can pretty much um, smooth this out if we go this other way with the seams. So 
it's going to cut the inside and outside, flattening this out and then flattening this area out over here as well. So let's unhide everything. Let's select this by itself. Clear this one. And then we have to remember we want to add a seam interior pieces uh, here. And then we're going to do the same thing up here. So missed one. I want to do it here. OK. So now if we grab all of these pieces and unwrap. Yeah, we should get fairly flat edges over here like we can see. Now, one thing that's really important when we get in here and we start baking um, normals, and this isn't as important in Blender, but it's extremely important when we jump into substance, is that we don't have any overlapping UVs uh, or faces over here. And so you'll be able to tell because uh, when you overlap a face, it has a brighter color that lets you know that something's going on. Uh, but if you see any of that, like here we have one that is overlapping. You just want to um, move those over and fix that because you'll start getting errors in, in substance because it doesn't like when that happens and it won't even let you attempt to use the program with them overlapping. Uh, your normals will be uh, messed up all over the place. So if it's even close and you have room, I would, I would kind of move things a little further apart and there always seems to need to be a little bit of tweaking no matter how well you unwrap the meshes uh, on these little pieces here, because it just doesn't do a perfect job of flattening all this out. So that's one thing that a lot of people forget to do when they start unwrapping and they, you know, they do a quick unwrap, they think everything's fine and they jump into another program uh, or they get weird rendering artifacts and they're confused as to why um, things are kind of broken. And it's because you have to make sure you don't have any overlapping UVs. So it's not important to get all these perfectly lined up because again, you're not going to see most of that, but you do want to make sure these are lined up correctly. Ballpark. Uh, Lauren is asking, is Substance Painter a program that's separate from Blender? Yeah, so the two programs I'm talking about right now are Substance Painter and Substance Designer. And I, we're not going to have a chance to get into those uh, today, but I will kind of open those up tomorrow and show you kind of how they look and what they do. Uh, and so I have another stream previously where we jumped into Substance Painter to work on the spoon. So if you missed that, go back to some of the earlier streams on my channel and uh, check that out because you'll be able to tell uh, a little bit about Substance from that stream. And okay, so it looks like everything is pretty well not overlapping at this point. You want to zoom in and make sure. Uh, but once you get to this point, one of the things you can do is you can turn on this stretching checkbox. Anything that's dark blue is good. That means that you're not stretching in those areas. Anything that's getting towards red is a, something you, you must fix no matter what you have to fix it because uh, you're really distorted. And then uh, yellows and greens are kind of in the middle and not super important. So again, these edges I know are going to be hidden from view because they're tucked in behind some of those seams on the model. And so I'm not really worried about stretching in those areas. So that's fine. It's a little more important on the stem because you're going to be able to tell um, in the texture when that's happening. But the good thing about having this checked off is that when you start moving things around, it'll start live uh, indicating in a live update, you know, if you're heading in the right direction with your textures as you try to unstretch them. So that, there was a good edit right there. And then these, you just kind of have to push and pull until you get them in a good place. And again, I'm not going to worry too much about this right now because uh, these sections, this is actually going to be tucked behind the other end of the pipe, so you're never going to see that. These are more important, um, but again, I'm not super concerned. You can select all of these. If you hit Control V on the keyboard, it'll start relaxing uh, these for you. And then you can scroll with your middle mouse button wheel to kind of um, dial in that effect in terms of how to unstretch. If it's helping, you know, head that direction. If not, you want to, you know, hit Escape and not do that. Uh, in this case, I think we're okay. So we're just going to leave that the way that it is. So here we go. 
Now, one of the things you do want to do is you want to maximize your UV space. And so uh, if we don't end up rescaling any of the stuff in the UV space here, we've got a lot of other area around here that is not being utilized. And so that's bad because we're wasting pixels. If we save an image that's you know, a 4K image, 2K image, 1K image, whatever, however big it is, and we have to have lots of images to texture our entire illustration, every little pixel counts because it takes up memory in the computer. And so uh, what most people do is they'll either take one object and scale up all the pieces to maximize this entire area. And so they fit it in here sort of like a jigsaw puzzle, or they'll include multiple models into one texture map uh, or UV layout so that they can maximize the usage. So uh, if I had other things on the pipe that I wanted to include in this texture map, like uh, these little uh, fins down here, or maybe this these other multi-res um, objects that I wanted to kind of work on. So this little um, window down here, or even this object is a multi-res object. Um, I could you know, use this on the same map. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet there, but that's just something to be aware of is you want to maximize the space that you have available in your UV lab. Okay, so now that we have everything kind of in place, if you want to kind of make sure that these are all uh, fitting inside the zero to one UV space, which is this entire box that you see here, uh, control A will uh, average the scale to match the scale in the 3D viewport for all of your UV islands, because it's possible to grab one of these and then scale it really, really big. And you know, obviously that's not in proportion to the way it is in the real 3D UV space over here. Uh, so to fix that, if you start scaling things around and you're not happy with that, you can just select everything and hit Control A and it will redistribute all of your scale uh, for your UVs to match what is in the real 3D view space. Uh, so, then what you want to do is you'll want to make sure that these are all not overlapping and they are all fitting inside this box, which is considered the zero to one UV space. And again, Substance will have a fit if you don't adhere to this because uh, it changes the way that it reads your textures. So uh, Control A will average your scale. Control P will pack these into the zero to one space without you having any worries. Uh, and what I always like to do just a little bit to make sure that these are packed with a little bit of a border as I scale them down a little bit so that I've still got a little bit of room on these uh, outside edges uh, just in case. So I'm also gonna do that here so I can space these out a little more. I don't like how tightly it packs these in. Um, you wanna get them pretty tight, but if you're ever having to jump in here by hand and paint any of these textures, in Photoshop or something, it's always better to leave yourself a tiny little bit of room on the outside edges so that you're not going to have trouble uh, isolating and painting these areas. So let me save this real fast. Okay, so now that we have this saved, what we need to do is create an image that we're going to use to bake onto. And um, so what we need to do here is going to create a new image. We're going to decide what resolution we want this image to be for our texture map. In this case, let's say we want it to be a 2K texture. So we're going to do a 2048 by a 2048. I'm going to name this normals and we'll maybe we'll name this uh, pipe stem normals. And then we'll leave the rest of the settings the same and just hit OK. It's going to create a big black image. And then what I always like to do immediately is save this somewhere on my hard drive. And so I'm going to jump into the textures over here. I'm going to create a new folder for the pipe. So we have one for the spoon here and we want to create one for the pipe. I'm going to save this texture here. Uh, so Lorian's asking, why is it okay to scale the skins down? Won't they no longer fit the pipe? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. If you're talking about the UV um, islands here for these UVs, in terms of scaling, all it does is take up more or less resolution for the details on your, uh, your mesh here. So let's say, let's add another image. I'm gonna hit X to get rid of this. I'm gonna create a new one. And this time I'm gonna select a, uh, a color grid here. And then let's hit okay to add that. Now, this is basically going to create a colored grid 
that helps you kind of align things when you're texturing. And so this is kind of a handy thing that's built into Blender. And once you have this image created, all you have to do to see it in your 3D viewport is jump over to this menu and then jump into texture. And I think you actually have to be in, uh, once you have it selected here, you actually have to have this selected in your node editor. So let me pull up the node editor. And let's jump over to the materials. I'm gonna create a new image texture here. And we're gonna select that same image that we have in the UV layout editor over here, which is just called untitled right now. And once we have this selected in our node editor, this will show up in our 3D viewport. Okay, so what this does is it basically shows you how your UVs are lining up on the pipe here uh, by applying this texture temporarily to uh, this material uh, or this model based on where the UV sits. So as I now reposition these UVs, you'll see this update live on the model down here. And so to see this happen in a bigger scale, I need to reposition something big, uh, but you can see how that live updates. And so I did this to show you kind of what happens when you would obviously imagine this texture to be something like wood, uh, you know, rock, whatever. It's not gonna be this grid. But as you scale, uh, watch what happens to the numbers and the grid on the pipe. So if I scale down, it's gonna use up less of this image and the, this, the texture is gonna appear bigger on the pipe. If I scale up, it's gonna use up more pixels, more area of the image, and it's gonna get smaller and smaller, okay? And so that's how you can kind of understand a little bit better like how texture uh, texturing works with UVs is that it's gonna use up as much of the image as you let it use. And so the idea here is you want it to use up as much of this as you can because that allows you to pack as much texture detail into the model as you can possibly get in here. And obviously you've seen pixelated blurry images on the internet if you have something that's only, you know, like 50 pixels wide or something like that, and it's only using up this much of the image, it's gonna appear blurry and pixelated and that's not what you want. And so that's why we, we save really, really large image files that are, you know, 1K, 2K, 3K, depending on how close it's gonna be to the camera. Uh, and so again, if we look at something like this object down here towards the end, and I were to move this around, you can actually see it updating uh, it's going to pick what part of the texture that I'm sitting on top of here. And so if I can, I'd like to scale this up so that I can get more texture packed into this area. But as I mentioned previously, these need to kind of, it's, it's a game you're trying to balance here in terms of balancing scale of your UV islands with um, not making things look too unrealistically detailed. And so what I mean by that again is if, these need to match scale so that the wood grain appears to be consistent from the tip of this pipe stem all the way down to the base. Uh, then that means the UV squares need to stay the same size pretty much throughout this entire thing. So just because I can make one of these things bigger um, doesn't necessarily mean that I should, okay? And uh, so you'll notice this is a good example the, the UV unwrap, try to UV unwrap this flat, and it also didn't take into account the fact that this tapers towards this end. And so if we look towards the front of the, the largest part of the pipe stem, you've got these big squares down here at this end with the big numbers. And as you get further and further down here, these are getting smaller and smaller. Now we don't want that because that's gonna be distorting the wood grain into a weird pattern. And so what we need to do is we actually need to um, taper the uh, pipe in the UV layout to sort of match the pipe as it is in the 3D viewport. And so all we need to do uh, is kind of play a little bit with the scale here. So I'm gonna pull this down here and we get it out of the way uh, that we can still kind of see what's going on. And now if we grab this section down here and I were to scale it on the Y axis, you can see we don't want this end to be smaller because this is the big end. If anything, we want it to be larger or we want to scale the other end smaller. And so I'm going to turn on proportional editing uh, with O, just like we have in the 3D viewport. And now when I 
use this the same way we would down here, you can see we can start matching the scale of this object so that it keeps that same consistency all the way down to this end uh, with the viewport. And I don't have to be perfect, but I do want to get it relatively close. You'll also notice that we need to uh, try to keep these squares um, square. And so if we start seeing these turn more into rectangles down here at the bottom, that means we're getting stretching. And we need to play with how things are kind of lining up here. And so pulling this direction seems to be kind of fixing part of that problem. And so now that we got this kind of dialed in this way, what we need to do is scale this entire thing back down to where it fits back into this UV space. So I'm going to turn off proportional editing. Let's fit it back into this box. And now we need to uh, reposition these objects so that they fit around the pipe here. So I hope that made sense. I know I kind of went over that quickly, but um, we'll get more into UV mapping tomorrow. And any questions that you think of tonight, be sure to let me know. And I will go ahead and uh, talk about those tomorrow. OK. So now we can kind of see this whole thing laid out correctly. Let's get rid of this image because we don't need it anymore. Uh, so the color grid that I was using to make the texture consistent is something built into Blender. Uh, I don't really know the name of what this is called, but if you want to make one, it's uh, it's built straight in. All you have to do is add a new image, and then under the generated type down here, you can select blank, which is what it normally is. Uh, you can select UV grid, or you can select color grid, and color grid is the one that we have here. If you want to select UV grid, that'll show you a different version that just has colored uh, checks, and then black and white. Uh, boxes and it's just a different version of this map and so if it's based on your preference whatever you want to use uh, for your 3d modeling and just to give you an idea of what this sort of looks like if we jump back into the node editor and swap out this texture here you can see this show up and it's it's just, again, based on preference. Whatever you think is easier to tell uh, overall scale what's going on, that's what you should use. And uh, I actually prefer this one over the color grid because I think zoomed out, you can see uh, scale-wise what all of these UV textures are doing uh, in unison lined up together. So yeah, there you go. Uh, so to get this to show up, again, remember you have to be in textured mode. And then jump into the cycles material for whatever uh, object you have selected. And then it doesn't matter where, but you have to add an image texture. And once you have an image texture anywhere in uh, the node editor, and it doesn't have to be connected to anything uh, or anything like that, all you have to do is have it selected. If you don't have it selected um, for some weird reason, it, it won't show up. But the first time you turn this on, add an image texture, select it, and it will show up once you have it selected out of this list for the images in your scene. OK, so let's get rid of this. Uh, and now we want to jump back into that uh, pipe stem normals image that we had up before. Remember, this is just going to be black to get started. And then we want to select this again in our um, image for this models, uh, this meshes material, uh, just like we were before for the UV material. Uh, and so once we have that selected, that's going to let Blender know that this is the image that we're going to be baking to. Now, it's really important that your high-res objects be placed on top of your low-res object in the same space. So I know I moved this over to the side, but what I need to do is um, move this back over to zero, zero on the y-axis, and that way they're stacked on top of each other. And this way, Blender knows um, what details it's transferring because they're in the same position from one object to another. Uh, and so then what we have is we have the high and the low version, and we're baking from the high to the low. And so we're going to select left click the pipe stem high, 
we're going to shift and left click the pipe stem low uh, to have that selected. And then in the uh, render menu, if we go down the very bottom of the menu, you're going to see this tab that says bake. And once we have everything done in this order, we've created an image, added this image to our low resolution uh, shader and cycles for this image um, or the shader. And we've selected the image we're baking to in our node editor. Then we've uh, selected our low resolution model first, uh, or sorry, we've selected our high resolution model first and then our low resolution object because we're baking to that object. Uh, so everything's selected in that order. Then we can jump down to our bake menu, grab our normal uh, section here, leave it on tangent space normals because that's the proper setting for um, uh, normals rendering that we're gonna be using today. And then we wanna go selected to active. Um, yeah, which means we take the original selected object, bake it to the active selected objects, which is our low resolution pipe. Uh, clear is going to, uh, every time it tries to bake, if you've done this before, it's going to clear this black to uh, back to a black image. And uh, so if you want to continuously bake more and more things to the same texture, you would want to uncheck this clear box because it's going to reset this image every time you try to bake. So once again, we're going to save, make sure that we have everything set up in case this crashes, and then we're going to hit bake and see what happens. Uh, so this shouldn't take too long because it's not a super high res object, um, but you never know. So now we're just going to let this bake. If you look in the upper uh, section here, you're going to see a percentage that tells you how long it's going to take um, or at least what percentage you're at. And you'll start seeing the option, uh, the object being filled in over here with a normal map as it bakes um, and goes through. Now, this is also gonna be using your render settings to bake uh, to this object. And so if we have these samples set up to something too high, this could take a lot longer uh, here. And so I'm not entirely sure if it's going to use the denoising um, as it's baking this, but that's an interesting test we can run to see if denoising actually works on baking normal maps. Uh, and so if we look at this now, you can see uh, kind of the result that we're getting. And if you are seeing any of this sort of red and green stuff going on here, that means that the normals didn't bake uh, far enough or they baked too far into the mesh. And so let me see if I can explain a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, this is bad. You want to have a, a whole map that's basically really smooth and kind of this color here. Uh, so looking over in the chat, uh, Lauren's saying, normal means the skin you're applying to the object. No. Okay. So normals refer to a uh, mathematical principle based on a polygon's surface. Uh, and let me talk a little bit about that because I understand that can be confusing. Uh, so if we jump into edit mode here, and we are going to be in solid. And then I'm going to solo this. So you're just seeing the low resolution object. And I'm going to jump into face mode. OK. Now, with face mode turned on, I think we've talked about this before. But if we jump down into the mesh display menu over here, you can see that under normals, we have options for displaying vertex normals, edge normals, or face normals. And if we turn face normals on, you can see that in the center of every single polygonal face that we have here, there's a line that's coming perpendicular out from the center of this polygon. And uh, again, this is a mathematical principle. You learn this in geometry, but basically the normal is uh, a, a property of a polygon that is a perpendicular calculation of, um, it's a perpendicular line striking the center of the polygon uh, that is talking about how light hits and is used to, in calculations for how to shade the object. And so each polygon has its own normal. They're always um, pointing perpendicular out from the surface of the face. And then using this tool down here, if we turn this on and we change the size, we can play with how long these are sticking out of the mesh. And so we talked about 
shading issues. Well, one of those things that we, we've seen on a regular basis is when we model, sometimes uh, we'll be going through and creating new objects. And sometimes when we create these objects and we extrude them, uh, we might have a normal flipped on the inside. And so when that happens, you get weird sort of black fringing and shading that happens on the mesh. And so if I turn the subdivisions up real fast, which I can't do on this model because we've already taken that down all the way to zero. But anyways, uh, you can see that there's a little bit of weird things happening on that mesh. And that's because the normal is actually flipped to the inside, as you can see there. And so what we typically do to fix this is we go into our tools palette and then we uh, look under, uh, it's actually under shading and UVs. And we look under the normals menu, you've got recalculate, flip direction, uh, set from faces. And so these three things will help you kind of change the direction of these normals. So recalculate, uh, if you have a whole bunch of things selected, we'll try to make them all point the same direction. Flip direction, we'll just flip it from inside to outside. And so you can flip inside, flip outside uh, using that. Uh, and that's the make normals consistent option there. So uh, face normals are important so that Blender cycles, whatever rendering engine you're using, knows how to shade an object properly. And it has more to do with Blender kind of knowing which side of a polygon is facing out. And so this would be telling us that these are all facing the same direction. These are all one consistent surface. But if we have one of them pointing in, that's going to tell us that this object's back is facing the camera. And uh, typically, you don't want that because um, it's going to be giving you weird artifacts uh, in the shading like that. So these normals are what we're talking about when we talk about normal maps, because uh, the way that normal maps work is they take all of these normals that exist here on a low resolution surface. And what we do is we bake a map from a high resolution surface, because if we jump into the normals for the high res objects, these also have normals. So if we were to go to edit mode and turn on the normals option here, every one of these faces also has normals. And here's a better example of kind of the perpendicular aspect of how these work. You can see it kind of looks like blades of grass. There's so many here kind of intersecting. And so as these hills on the surface of these, uh, this pipe stem kind of rolls along, you can see these kind of starting to point in different directions. So if I turn this down a little lower, you can kind of see how, how much this change. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the normals from this mesh and we're trying to apply all of the bumpy surfaces and the scratches and the wood grain and all that type of stuff onto the low resolution object. We have to use a trick for that. And the trick that we're using is, is a normal map, which allows us to transfer information in a texture map from the high resolution object to the low resolution object. And so that's what we're basically doing is we're saying, let's bake all the detail from this object here to this object here. And that's why we end up uh, spending all this time sculpting all these details. And then we're going to go back and make a low res version that our computer can, can render quickly. And uh, this is exactly how they do it for games as well. They would create really high resolution versions like this, uh, and then low resolution versions that they can use to quickly generate, uh, you know, really good looking graphics on screen. Okay. So the problem here, as we're looking at this, is that our normals that we've been talking about are um, in our bake menu are paying attention to this ray distance setting. And these rays, if you look at the, the length of these normals that we have showing here, uh, this is what it's using to calculate the ray distance. So ray distance should be about the same as whatever display size we have turned up in our viewport here. Because remember, we have to bake through two objects, uh, the thick one here, and it's using a ray distance of zero. So that's like having the size of the normals turn all the way down to nothing, uh, less than this, which is why we're getting all of this weird shading because it can't poke through enough to get through the surface here. So we need to turn this up at least to, let's say 0.02, so it can get all the way through the thickest parts of the high res sculpt here. So I think that may be enough. Just to be safe, let's get a 0.025 and see if that adds enough thickness for something like around here. 
I think it will. So let's turn that back off. And then let's set this ray distance to the same number, 0 0.025. And now let's bake again. So we're gonna select our high res first. Then shift select our uh, low res objects. Make sure we have the right texture selected in our uh, cycles node editor over here, which is the pipe stem normals. And then under the bake menu down here, we're gonna make sure we have the clear thing uh, selected it's because we wanna get rid of this and rebake it. And then we're gonna hit bake again. Okay, Lauren's asking in the chat, does the link that you designate the normals matter in the shading or just make it easier to see them? So it basically just gives you a guide to go off of so that whatever you set in the viewport, you can visually see, is it going through the both meshes? Yes, okay, let's copy this value over to the ray distance and that's what it's gonna use. Now there's another method you can use which is called this cage and that actually allows you to create a third mesh which dictates how far out to go from uh, from the mesh to bounce those rays around the scene. Uh, but I've never really had a need for that. So um, in more complex objects, you would need it. Um, but for most things, the ray distance works pretty well. So uh, looking here, we pretty much have it uh, wrapped up. All of these areas in this object are pretty much good. Here we've got this pretty well taken care of. And it looks like we needed a little bit more in some of these areas over here. So. I'm gonna turn this up just to rebake it so we get a clean mesh, but most of these areas are fine at this point. So let's try 0.03. And I would incrementally uh, turn this up just a little bit unless you've got some really funky things going on here because it doesn't take much distance to uh, make this work, so. Uh, so Lauren's asking, why are we applying the high res normals to the low res object? Does that conserve memory? And yes. Uh, it's because the poly count is ridiculously high. So if we just look at, um, let this bake and see if I can start playing a little bit more with Blender while it's doing this. Uh, but let's just say we select one of these objects. I'm still gonna let me until it finishes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. We're looking at 9 million faces for this pipe stem right here um, with, with the uh, resolution turned all the way up under the multi-res modifier that we applied. And so because of that, and actually I think that's showing all of these other objects in the scene as well, because I had that soloed. Um, but even if we jump into edit mode and we just look at the count here, We've got, um, yeah, almost a million, uh, well, okay, so almost half a million faces just in the stem. And that's one part of one object of an entire scene of objects. Uh, and so if every object needs to have this much detail, uh, and sometimes it does, and most things you wanna make look as good as you can, uh, and, and you know, the octopus is quite a bit more dense than this. So if I jump into edit mode on the octopus, and we look at the number of faces uh, that we have here on just the octopus, we've got 1,665,000 and um, yeah. So again, that's without even the ship underneath, you know, here or anything like that. And so because of that, we're, we're upwards of 20 million with everything turned on, that's one object. And again, uh, what we wanna do is we wanna get an object down as low as we possibly can. And the goal is to go as low as you can without losing enough resolution. And typically the way that I define that is that uh, it's, it's based on distance from the camera to the object. It's also based on silhouette reading. So if we're this close to the object, you can see if we look down the edge of this pipe, we've got some really jagged edges happening. And because of that, uh, if we were gonna be this close on the pipe to do the final render, it would probably be an issue. But you have to remember, we're gonna be, we're gonna be out here with our final camera from this uh, scene over here. Remember, uh, we're gonna be looking down on the table and it's gonna be up here somewhere. And so because we're that far away, even at a super high resolution render, we're not gonna see enough of that silhouette uh, curvature to matter and we can bake a low res object. And most, most objects should be baked at a low res unless you absolutely have a reason not to. Um, 
So Lloyd's asking, she's saying, uh, but you had to create the normals on the high res object first in order to get the proper detail. Then you can peel it off and put it on a low res object. Exactly. Yeah. So the whole process of creating all of the spoon details and sculpting those and creating all of the detail on the ship and all this stuff is because uh, we had to have something for, for the detail to show up on. And then we had to create a low res version that allows us to transfer all of that information and it's like um, it's like flattening an image in Photoshop, basically. In Photoshop, if you have all of these layers, you have hundreds of layers in a, in a really complicated edit, it's going to take up tons of memory. It's going to take you forever to save it. And it's harder on your system and all that stuff, and obviously a lot of hard drive space. But the second you merge all those layers down into one object or you flatten the image, all it has to do now is save one layer, and the file size is really, really small, and it speeds your computer up. And it's the same idea here. Uh, the more we can simplify the scene and just put most of the, the heavy lifting into the texturing uh, so that Blender has, has a hard time reading millions of polys. What it doesn't have a hard time reading are millions of pixels because pixels are a lot smaller. They take up a lot less memory. And so the idea is always to find out what the shortcut is to get you where you want to go and then be as conservative as you possibly can. And that applies to any aspect in 3D, whether it's uh, texturing, animation, uh, you always wanna take the path of, least, path of least resistance and find the best way forward that doesn't gonna take you um, or your computer you know, a hard time to do this. Now, when we get into doing things that uh, we talk about like Pixar doing an animated movie, they have you know render farms, they have you know dozens and dozens of servers um, that render these in big, big warehouses uh, for for scenes. But they're doing a much bigger project with much more scenes, much more animation, many more files. And even there, they have to find ways to conserve um, space and 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 textures and things like that, so that they can pull all of the bigger and better things off every time they render something because. Um, it always exponentially scales and every artist is going to want to pack as much as they can into their portion of the project. And uh, so this technique was created um, primarily as a real time, you know, time saver, because this is the primary technique used in uh, game development to put a lot of really um, impacting graphics on the screen uh, in a way that something like a PlayStation or an Xbox can render really, really quickly. Uh, and so a lot of things that you see on screen with cars and characters and things like that, they may only have a couple of thousand polys each. Uh, hero characters that are in cutscenes can be upwards of 50 to 100,000 polys. But, you know, that's not a lot considering how, how much it takes to create really, really detailed stuff. So you have to pack all that into the texture. Uh, okay, so... Still getting some issues. This is uh, pretty much on the inside, I think, of all of the stuff we're looking at here. So I can double check that if I right click on the low res version to select that. I want to make sure I don't have the high res selected. Let's jump into edit mode. And then let's take a look at, uh, let's select all of our, our pieces of our mesh here. That's going to show us the UVs. And then what I want to do is uh, let's turn on this button right here, which allows me to select faces in, in this uh, section and which will simultaneously select them in a 3D viewport for me as well. And so now if I start selecting these um, faces here, it's going to show up down here. So if I look at these problem areas and I select these faces, we can see that these are on the inside of the mesh. And because they're on the inside of the mesh and we're never going to see them, I'm not, I'm not concerned at all about the way that those normals are baking. Uh, and so let's, uh, let's just leave well enough alone at this point. And then let's take a look at how to apply the normal map back in Blender on the low res object. So preview that. Uh, how am I doing on time? 821. Okay. So jump out of local view. And we've got our low res object here. Let's move this to a new layer. So I'm going to move this to the same layer as we have our uh, high res uh, ship on. And actually, what I probably want to do is move it onto another layer that's blank. So let's move it over to layer eight. 
Okay, so all we have left is the low res. So at this point, what we can do, if we jump into our node editor, is we can take the, uh, the normals map that we just baked. I'm gonna save this so that it's on my hard drive somewhere. And now if we jump into the, um, the node editor for this shader, what we have here is we have our image file for that normal map. And if I were to use my node wrangler to create a quick connection to the out output of the material, and then I were to start rendering this, you can see that it will show our um, normal map on top of the mesh. So we can see that it's using the UV map to properly apply this to the mesh, just the way we want it. And now we're gonna use this to drive all of the surface bumps that we see on the mesh uh, here. So uh, to make this work properly, what I need is to turn on a, a layer that has some lighting. And so I'm gonna turn this layer on down here. And now we can kind of see what this looks like. So let's actually switch this out with this layer. Maybe this layer. Yeah, this layer's better. Okay. So let's turn off some of these menus. Okay. So now what we can see here is we can see the, the color of the material textured. We can see the wood grain uh, and everything else. But if we look at the highlights, it gives it away pretty quickly that all we have here is a really, really smooth um, material that doesn't have any bumps in the actual surface. And so we want to get around that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our normal map that we just created, and we need to hook this up to the uh, normal inputs of all of the sections that are controlling the surface uh, look of our mesh. So we've got a uh, diffuse material that has the wood grain sort of effect. We've got a, a rough gloss on top of that that's being combined here and just sort of mixed together. And then we have the actual reflection gloss here that is being combined with a Fresnel value on top of that. Uh, and then we've got a little bit of displacement being added here uh, that you can see coming from this wood. But this isn't actually showing up very much because there's not enough geometry to displace what's going on there. So instead of using this displacement, we're gonna disable this, we're gonna disconnect that, and we're gonna use normal maps instead of displacement. So to do this, what we need to do is, I'm going to make the node editor all the way across. We're gonna add a converter, uh, actually vector normal map. And then what we need to do is we need to plug our image texture for our normal map into the color input there. Make sure that you set your color to non-color data uh, because that's for, any displacement or normal maps, it's not actually reading the color data. It's using uh, the data as XYZ coordinates. And so Blender needs to know that this is not uh, texture information that's going to be coloring the mesh. Uh, so we're using this as, as height values. And so let's uh, convert, connect that. We're gonna make sure we set this to our UV map, which we can find labeled right here under UV maps. And then we remember we baked this as a tangent space normal under our um, bake settings down here. So let's leave this at tangent space. And now what we can do is we can start connecting this up to different inputs of our uh, shaders here. So let's connect the normal input to our diffuse material. And then let's connect it also to our glossy. So that will add a little bit of the roughness and the bumping that you can see here. And then we continue to add this to the glossy down at the bottom for the bigger highlights. And then we do the same thing for the Fresnel at the top up here. Okay, so adding all of those in gives us what we need to have for our low res to look like our high res. And so now, from a distance especially, this should look appropriate, just like our high res did. But it's also much, much faster in the viewport because again, we're rendering the low res objects. So, if we're gonna look at the poly count here, we're only dealing with 1400 faces, which is pretty good considering. This is not a real-time scene, it's a 3D illustration, and that's kind of what we're going for. So if we want a little bit more reflection on the edges, we can lower the Fresnel power value here, get a little bit more reflection from the highlights there. 
And now we've got sort of a glossy wooden pipe stem. So this is effectively what we need to do to every single piece of our pipe in order to get it sped up so that we can put it back into our main scene. And uh, what we can do now is just apply the multi-res because we don't need that anymore. And so now that we've already UV unwrapped this, all of our uh, UV seams will still be in the same place, but our higher resolution uh, with the subdivision level of one will be applied. And there we go, guys. That's all you gotta do to uh, take the multi-res and apply a high to a low workflow there. And so what I would probably do now is take this and move it over to my backup layer so that I've got that in case something terrible happens and I need to rebake this. Um, but now everything that I need is there. So yeah, I will be repeating the same process uh, throughout the week to get this up to a finished level. And then we will be talking a little bit more about uh, jumping into substance uh, tomorrow a little bit to texture this up. Uh, Lorian's impressed. All right, that's good. That's why I'm doing this. Got to stay on top of my game. Uh, all right, guys. So we are sort of at the end of the session tonight. We got about half an hour left. I don't mind talking about something specifically if you guys want to talk about the workflow or get a little bit more into the rest of the projects and we can talk about that. Uh, if you guys don't have anything else, I don't mind starting to retopo so you guys can see some of that process. Uh, it's not super interesting if you've seen me do it before, but it is definitely necessary to so get a low res version of this dynamic topo object. Um, so yeah, tomorrow, again, we're going to be jumping into substance and I'm going to be doing some more hand painted textures on objects in the scene. So what we haven't talked about yet is uh, we, we, we've got a lot of paper objects left to texture up. We've got the postcard over here in the back. This is gonna be some sort of train ticket, I think. This may be a, like a mail, a stamp, or a newspaper, or I don't know what it's gonna be. Something that he's pasted into the book here. Um, we've got this paper currency in this section that needs to be dirtied up because it's way too clean, there's no wrinkles, so we need to mess around with that. Obviously still need to texture uh, the teacup and everything over here with proper um, you know, hand painted details, things like that. So we got lots to do. We need to fix the dusty texture on this object. I'm not sure if you guys saw where we ended up in this uh, scene. So let me kind of show you the last work in progress. I'm sure some of you have seen this before, but basically this is kind of where we're at. Uh, it's getting there, you know, but there's uh, quite a bit I want it to do. And so the pipe will probably end up somewhere over here, uh, maybe over here, not really sure yet. And then I have the gigantic Atlantean amulet centerpiece going right here. I'm saving that for uh, the course that I'm going to be teaching on 3D illustration so I can show this entire process all over again uh, for people that take the course. So if you miss a stream, no worries. Uh, I'm going to be going through much more detailed example uh, using an entirely new object here. And uh, yeah, anything that you guys have that you'd like me to work on or um, maybe suggestions for the scene, stuff you'd like to see, or, uh, you know, at this point we're kind of wrapping up and getting to a finalized version, so we can't do any major changes. Uh, but if you guys want to see me dirty something up or, um, you know, talk about things and in, in the 3d illustration course, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm going to be going in and talking about, uh, little aspects like we did tonight from every section of the uh, 3d illustration. And I'm also going to be talking about, um, the, the process of wrapping everything up and compositing render layers, how to paint stuff in Photoshop so that when you get this thing rendered out from Blender, you can take it back into a painting program and, uh, you know, really give it the finishing touches and learn how to do some tips and tricks there for touching up some things. Uh, cause there's always some stuff that you can't really pull off in 3d and, or it would take way too much time to do it in 3d. And so, uh, I don't know any 3d artists who doesn't, you know, touch up their stuff in Photoshop to kind of make it look, you know, 10% better at the very end. Uh, but yeah, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Lauren says the position of the pen implies a right-handed archaeologist, so the pipe should probably appear on the right. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe. 
that's the original um, position I was thinking about for the pipe. So maybe it'll end up over there. And you know, the hard part about this is like getting in here and just making sure that you're not gonna end up with a scene that is too clean, you know? Uh, because the, the biggest problem I think most artists have with a scene like this is that right around now or maybe long before now, they get bored and they wanna move on or, or whatever and they, they get it to this point and then they just wanna get it done and they publish it and they move on. And the problem is, if you really want to do a scene like this justice, you really have to, you know, take your energy and, and run it like a marathon. And at the very end, you have to jump back in and really put all of your time and effort into dirtying things up because dirtying things up is what makes it look aged. What gives it that, that final, uh, you know, pass that makes everybody stop when they're looking through, uh, on the web or whatever. And they're, they're going to stop and go like, wow, like, you know, that took that image from like, eh, you know, to, man, I can't, I like, how do they do that, you know? And that's kind of always what I feel like everybody's trying to get to is that stage where people go like, is that a photo? Like, is it? And they have to stop and take a second look. If you've done that and you've gotten to a point where you're, and especially when you're trying to do a photorealistic render, if you get someone to a point where they're on Instagram and they're like, is that a render or is it a photo? And they can't tell, you've done your job. Like that's, that's the ultimate, you know, gold medal for somebody that is a CG artist is, you know, uh, or better yet, they just assume it's a photo and they move on. And, you know, that's, uh, for VFX guys, especially it's like, uh, the c most common phrase I hear all the time from VFX artists in the industry is like, if people like get through a movie and they don't notice what I did to it, they don't notice my work. Like I did my job because um, people that are doing green screen or they're adding, you know, touch up effects or, and you wouldn't believe how many like special effects are added to the stuff that doesn't even feel like it needs a special effect, but it's done so well and it's done so subtly uh, and with such finesse that these artists that never get credit for it are, you know, replacing reflections and windows and doing all sorts of stuff all over the place. And you never even know that it's there. You just, you miss it because it's so good. And it's sort of the same thing here. You know, if, if it comes off like a photo, like I did my job, you know? Uh, and so that's kind of what we're going for. There's always little things that kind of give it away. And anything that you think of as you're looking through your scene and you're going, man, I wish I could do that a little bit better. Um, make a note of it and, and realize like there may be a way to do it in 3D, but there's definitely a way to fix it in post and Photoshop. Um, and one of the things that I, I noticed right off the bat, just as an example, is where the spoon is hitting the surface of this uh, this T here. You know, most of it looks good, but there's a very sharp edge where the spoon hits the T. And I've always wanted to have sort of some T droplets or something, uh, sort of transitioning that from where the spoon might have been stirring something. And it should have a little bit of, you know, a curvature or something coming up the side of the spoon. And uh, there wasn't a great way to do that in 3D without shadowing starting to happen, which makes the illusion kind of get lost. Uh, so that's just one example of something I'm seeing as I look around. There's there's not enough wrinkles. These look brand new, like they came off the press yesterday. We don't want that. Uh, this wood looks terrible right now. They're, the grain is way too straight. Uh, that needs to be dirtied up. And I don't know if... I may think about going back in the substance and using texture uh, from there because doing this procedurally is always a, a much bigger pain in the butt than it needs to be um, because procedural wood is, unless you've already got it saved and you've, you've already spent a lot of time generating it, it's it's always hard to nail. Um, so might do that because substance has some great wood textures. Um, <laughs> Lorian's asking, she, she's been dying to know why I switched from uh, Mac to Windows because that seems backwards. And it kind of is. If, if Mac had done a better job, uh, you know, dealing with their customers, I probably wouldn't have. Um, but, you know, let's talk about this for a second. Let's just, all right. I'm switching over because I, I have to go on a little tirade right now because of Mac and Windows. I started using Windows, um, I was a programmer in college. I was also an artist, but I was a coder. I have a minor in computer science. And so 
uh, I was Windows all the way through college. And then right towards the end, I switched over to Mac because that's what everybody at my studio was using when I graduated and then got a job. And um, I was diehard Mac like forever. Uh, 2004 is when I bought my first Mac tower, you know, my, my power station or whatever. And, um, I was in love with it for 10 years. You know, I spent, I spent time with it and love the operating system. And I love pretty much everything about the brand. But the problem is like they didn't innovate. And so you've got all these windows machines coming out with bigger and better specs. You've got faster machines, 64 bit stuff happening, uh, which Mac did keep up with in terms of the operating system, the 64 bit stuff. But then the graphics cards started getting super fast. We went from two gigs to four gigs to eight gigs to 11 gigs now, um, even faster than that in some cases. And along with it, the processors started getting increased. And I, the problem is like, I was at the top of the food chain as a Mac user. I had the most you know, decked out tower that I could build as a Mac Pro user and 10 years went by and they didn't bother to update anything. Like they didn't get Nvidia graphics cards in there. They didn't get anything going. And as a 3D artist, like I could put up with it as a Photoshop user, right? But as a 3D artist, especially as a Blender user, I was struggling because people were coming out with stuff all day long that I wanted to try out new techniques and things like that on the web. And it's like, I couldn't do it with my two gigabyte graphics card. And so out of desperation, like I, I upgraded my, my internal graphics card on my Mac Pro um, to a like six gigabyte NVIDIA. It helps for a while. And then uh, last year I was just like, I've had enough. And so, um, yeah, I built a custom Windows 10 PC and, you know, I still have Mac laptops. I still have an iPad, you know, I still have iPhone, uh, but like, as much as I love like the smoothness of the OSs and the way they work together and it's seamless and all that stuff, like they have their own little bubble that they exist in and they say they're for creatives and they, they get on that, that, you know, that kick, but like, they're not for power creatives. They're not for power users and they can say they are all they want. But, uh, anyways, I need to jump back into art and stop talking about this, but, uh, man, I'm passionate about it. Cause like, I wanted to stick with Apple, but they forced me after 10 years of refusing to get better at anything. And their little trash can update or whatever that I got excited about until I saw the specs, like it's not good enough. I mean, to, to build an equivalent Mac, uh, you know, little, little Mac system that I would have now comparatively to what I built with my Windows 10 PC, it would cost me seven to 10 grand to build the same thing on a Macintosh. Uh, in terms of my graphics card specs and all that stuff. And it's like, it's not worth it. Like, I give up. I Uncle, I got to give in, you know? And so if they ever get their act together, like, I'm not saying I would never switch back. But, um, yeah, I mean, most of the people that I know, uh, if they hate Windows, they run Linux. You know, they, they don't mind getting their hands dirty and jumping in and, uh, you know, getting into Linux, which uh, which I used to do too. So... You never know, but uh, Blender is where it's at for me. And uh, as long as I can do Blender, I'm good. Uh, so Lauren's saying, I have a Radeon Pro Vega 64 uh, graphics card, iMac Pro. Will I have trouble with that? I'm not sure. I have two, uh, two AMD um, W7100 eight gigabyte cards in my system. And, uh, so those are working decently. Um, I really prefer Nvidia just because they have uh, CUDA, which t seems to work what better with Blender. Um, I can't say that for sure. I mean, I, I think the guys that are running Linux that use AMD cards with Blender, um, you know, I've heard as much as a 25% speed boost just because they're running Linux. Um, and, I, and that may have a better um, result. Uh, with the AMD cards on Linux as well. I'm not really sure, but if I get a chance to get some decent NVIDIA cards, I'm definitely going to go NVIDIA. Um, but because of the Bitcoin and, and all of the stuff happening with that sort of, uh, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining and stuff like that happening right now, the graphics cards are so expensive and uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. So like save your money until 
Bitcoin goes down in, in price or uh, this whole, you know, data mining thing is uh, has kind of blown over because it's it's getting ridiculous and uh, graphics cards are twice what they were, you know, two years ago because of all the hype. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that should be fine as far as your graphics card goes. Like I would I would run some tests like there's benchmark scenes for Blender that you can get uh, from blender.org. And I think they're also available from Blender Cloud. Just Google uh, Blender benchmark scenes. And what they are is basically um, standardized scenes that are provided for free for everybody to use to benchmark how fast their computer is or how well it's doing with rendering. And so what you do is you download that scene, start rendering it, and um, just see if your computer can handle it. Uh, and, and it'll depend. I mean, once we get into using 2.8 and we start talking about EV more and uh, it's less about cycles is the only way to do something because EV can kind of pick up some of that slack. It's not going to be nearly as important to have a computer that uh, is a power computer as much as it's going to be to have a computer that at least can do what an Xbox or a PlayStation can do in terms of the graphic processing. And so... Um, you should see also um, a boost in performance with 2.8 when it rolls out in a couple of months. So uh, be looking forward to that. And uh, like I said, I'll be digging way more into that as we get into um, courses and tutorials and things. Uh, I'm, I'm close to starting to do more tutorials on this channel, but uh, I have some reasons I'm waiting uh, right now to get things in place. And so once that happens, uh, apart from the live streams, you're going to start seeing more and more short tutorials coming out for uh, things that are happening on this channel. Uh, and right now I'm also working on upgrading the, uh, the Orange Guild blog and uh, the, also the, uh, the settings inside the guild so that we can have a better experience overall. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's take a look. We got a quick 15 minutes. Anything you want me to talk about, Lorian, before we have to go tonight? I'm willing to do that, so just let me know. Let's see. With... With everything turned on, let's see how heavy this is. Let's see. Okay, so this is all of the high res pipe sections turned on all at the same time, and we have 28 million polys right now. If we were to turn on the original scene with that, we're at 30 million polys, 30 million and a half. So you can see we got some problems. We've got we got some things we got to solve. If we just look at the scene here, we're only sitting on a million uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand. And so, there's obviously some things I can do to optimize the scene. I can go back and retopo uh, most of these objects to kind of lower the resolution. Um, but one to two million uh, as a final scene count is not that bad. Um, you know, one of the big things here is going to be this object, which has you know. 32, almost 33,000 faces. This one's pretty dense as well, 11,000. Um, the pin probably has quite a few. If we look at the, uh, yeah, the subsurf. All of these objects have subsurf turned on pretty much, or they did before we applied it. And so that's all gonna add to the poly count that we see in the upper section here, because uh, it's calculated based on all of the subdivision levels that you have turned on. Uh, and so one of the other things I want to talk about real quick is this option. If you look under the scene tab here and you jump down to the bottom, you've got an option here called simplify. If you check this off, this will really, really easily allow you to, um, if you want to set up settings for your scene that are um, sort of simplified so that you're not turning all of your modifiers up way, way high. And this is useful for preview rendering uh, before you get to the final render section, stuff like that. You've got uh, basically the same sort of settings you would have in a subdivision surface modifier here, 
But what it tells you is that while you have Simplify checked off, in the viewport, I'm just gonna show you one subdivision level max. And then over here, this is what we're actually gonna use for rendering. And so this is the maximum subdivision level. And so it will take object subdivision level settings uh, from your subsurface modifiers into account. So if this is only going up to three, and then under Simplify, you have this up to six, it's still only gonna use the third level of subdivision. Uh, so you're not gonna go above and beyond what you already have in the scene. But with Simplify turned on, we can go from something like uh, almost a million polys here down to uh, 683,000, as you can see there. So we get a major reduction uh, just from seeing that. We can also turn this all the way down to zero. So we're not seeing any subdivision in the viewport and that's gonna take us down to 570,000. Now, the reason that's still so high is because we've already applied uh, subdivision uh, surface modifiers to these objects. And so these are permanently applied with the proper subdivision level. And that's only because we imported these uh, with that subdivision applied already um, in order to get them kind of in the right place. And that was when we were using linking. So now that we're not using that, all the other objects in the scene that still have these, we can uh, use the simplify setting to keep this low. We're also using a lot of particles on this, which is adding to this, uh, this count you see over here. But typically this would really, really help you kind of lower and speed things up in the 3D viewport if that's slowing down for you. Uh, you also have particle settings that you can lower down. So if these are live, and I don't believe they are still um, here, it looks like they actually are. So if we take the particle settings down lower, you will actually see this reducing what we see in the 3D viewport, but it will save some geometry as well. So we can take this down to 0.1. And if that's live, then again, this is gonna be lower as we go on. So it looks like we already turned those off over there. So that probably won't do anything for us. But you got a lot of other options here uh, in terms of limiting um, how much ambient occlusion it bounce around the scene. And uh, you've got texture limitations and all sorts of stuff here. So that is a really useful setting uh, to keep in mind. Remember to turn this off when you are actually trying to preview your renders uh, at full resolution, because if you are using the preview rendering in the viewport, it's gonna go off of whatever setting you have set here. So when you get to your final stages, the best bet is to just turn this off because I've forgotten to do that sometimes. And that can lead to some problems because you'll spend a lot of time looking around your scene and trying to figure out what is going on. And then you'll realize that, oh, I had Simplify turned on. Uh, so that can be an issue. All right, let's also disable curves. That was for this weekend. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna do something a little weird. For the last 10 minutes, I'm going to show you a preview of Hard Ops because I kind of started learning it this weekend and it was a lot of fun. Uh, so there's two add-ons that kind of come with Hard Ops. They're actually separate add-ons that you can buy, but they're linked together from the same company. So if you look at Hard Ops, I know Lorian was asking a little bit about what Hard Ops is, how it works, what it does. Uh, so this will kind of be a really quick example of how this works. Um, hard Ops is a really fast way to get hard surface models created in Blender, and it is a maybe one one maybe the all time most popular add on for Blender that I've seen. Uh, so that's saying a lot. Let's start by adding a cube to the scene to get started. And hard ops is great because it basically allows you to bevel the edges of uh, hard surface meshes really, really quickly without having to use subdivision surface modifiers. So because of that, it speeds you up, saves poly counts, and is a revolutionary way to kind of work with the scene. So the way this works is uh, if you use the Q menu, that is the shortcut menu in the 3D viewport for hard ops, um, you can actually hide most of the menus and just use this. And if you use C sharp in here, you're gonna see some things pop up at the bottom and it's basically gonna bevel the edges. So if we bring this back up and we select B width, you can dial in how 
how much this is beveling the edge here. Now this does this over the entire model simultaneously. And so the idea here is to adapt yourself to the workflow, embrace it, and then you'll be able to really quickly get in here and start working with hard ops. Uh, and what's great is there's another add-on called Box Cutter that is uh, part of the hard ops workflow. And with both of these installed, you can start using Box Cutter uh, to create custom shapes here. So if I jump into like a side view and then I hit Alt W, which starts the uh, box cutter menus here, you can see that by selecting uh, different options like box, and you can see the menu here for how to uh, adjust these um, settings, that I can start cutting into this mesh using something called Boolean operations. And this basically lets me uh, add or subtract shapes to an existing shape by creating other shapes, sort of like cookie cutters in the 3D viewport. Uh, so if we start here and I use control with this other object selected, you'll see a red box and that's gonna let it cut out a square from this object. And I can do this over and over and over and over again to create more and more complex objects. Now what's great about this is that hard ops is still able to be active while this is running. And so if I hit Q to bring up this menu again, I can still continually adjust the bevel on this object live. And so all of this is kept continually kept live throughout the process, uh, at least up until a certain point. And so what's really, really cool about box cutter is there's options for symmetry that you can turn on. And I have a lot more left to learn to master this, but um, by hitting D to bring up the box cutter menu while it's active, uh, you've got all of your options available in the 3D viewport. You can uh, turn your mirror settings on and off. And so if I were to mirror across the Y axis, let's try a uh, box again. And if I hold control and left click and drag, you can see that it will mirror that as I am creating. And the idea is that doing this by hand would take a lot of time. Um, but doing it using hard ops or box cutter saves you quite a bit of time to at least block this in, right? And you can jump to any view and do the same thing. So now I wanna switch to an end gone. And now when I start cutting, it'll let me draw a shape here for what I wanna do. And again, I still have mirroring turned on. So once I complete the shape, I can hit enter and it will cut off that corner. And so it's a new way of modeling. It's kind of like sculpting, but with hard surface objects. And what I like about this a lot is that it really allows you to stop thinking about all of the problems of modeling with polygons and focus more on getting uh, the creativity generated and going uh, with, with things in your scene. And so another really cool option here is circle, which allows you to cut holes in the objects, as you can see here. So it lets me drill a hole all the way through. And again, modeling this would have taken some time, you know, and we're saving time here. Uh, so Lorian's asking, are hard ops and box cutter included in Blender or are they plugins? These are plugins that you purchase from uh, a site like Gumroad or the Blender Market, and uh, they're really, really cheap. Um, I think right now, hard ops is only like 15 bucks. Box cutter is about the same amount of money. And they're updated often. The guy that uh, has created these, Jerry Perkins, is an amazing artist. Uh, lots of YouTube videos. His, uh, his YouTube name is Master Zeon 1001 um, And yeah, he's had a, a lot of really good success with this. He's got an incredible team behind him. A lot of the developers that are working on this plugin have also uh, worked on developing Blender. And so uh, again, really, really incredible. And uh, again, so it's the idea is with symmetry turned on, uh, you've got a lot of settings. Hitting spacebar will allow you to dynamically reposition the circle to where you want to cut. Uh, you can also hit control C so that it will copy uh, the shape that you have in place at the current size. And so that will cut a hole and then you can do the same thing. You can start creating a circle, hit control V to paste the same size. And then again, just repeat this to create a bunch of holes in sequence that are all in position. You've also got options like only cut to uh, where the 3D cursor is. So if I go to the side here and I say, okay, well, I only wanna drill down to about this depth on the model, then uh, no matter where this is height wise, if I jump into the top view and let's say I wanna switch back into a box, I can draw a box now 
And it's only going to drill down to that depth if after I start drawing the box, I let go of control. I've still got my left mouse button clicked and I'm dragging. And now if I hold Alt and I release, it's only gonna go down to where that 3D cursor was. So you've got a lot of really, really cool options that you have to play with in these menus. But if you're into hard surface modeling and you're watching this, then I would highly recommend at least educating yourself a little bit on hard offs. Uh, because it is a fantastic shortcut for getting in here and playing. And once again, with all of this still active, I can at any point in time jump into B-Width and re-adjust uh, this bevel so that it is changing live. Now, one of the other fantastic things that you get with Hard Ops is the ability to cut in special inserts, uh, which is the last thing that I'll show tonight before I duck out. But this is really where the uh, benefit of this workflow shines because after you've spent a lot of time kind of working on your mesh, oh, and by the way, if I deselect this and I create a, another object here, let's say I create a circle, which will do like a cylinder uh, for me, it'll actually just draw a cylinder in 3D space. So let me undo that and then turn off my, uh, my symmetry here. So let's say I draw a cylinder somewhere here. I can reposition this somewhere uh, in the scene. And let's say I want to add this onto the back end of my object. So I got two separate objects here. Uh, so we're gonna select both of these and then I can use control plus and this is actually built into Blender, this uh, Boolean operation. It's one of your modifiers you can see here. So you don't have to have hard ops to play with this. You just go to the uh, modifier section and select two objects and you can Boolean them. Uh, but once that's done, once I've got an entire mesh here uh, that's joined with this mesh, I can hit Rebool and it will automatically join all the seams together for me in a totally new object. And so now, if I were to get rid of the rest of these, I've got a single object here that I can hit with a smooth shade. And now that's all one continuous object. So if we jump into edit mode, you can see that's actually connected, which is really, really cool. And it's got that bevel still added in. So with Rebool, I can again hit B with at any point in time and dynamically change this. So at some point, if you guys are interested, I may do an entire course on this. Um, might see if I can get Jerry's blessing and what he thinks about that. But uh, anyway, so that's one thing you can do. And then we can talk about the last feature, which is really, really incredible, which are called inserts. So if we uh, jump down to the inserts menu here, this is piggybacking off of the, uh, where is it? Yeah, under the tools palette, I have another uh, add-on that I bought called asset management. This allows you to load in uh, your own models that you've created and save them in categories, and then you can insert them automatically into any scene. And this is separate from hard ops, but it uses it in conjunction. So what's cool about this is that if you select this, go to the insert menu, you can grab uh, one of these inserts, and these come bundled with the plugin. And uh, what you can do now is grab something that looks interesting that you wanna put into your hard surface model, and you can actually use uh, the hard ops built in uh, functionality to insert this into your mesh. So let's say I wanna add a vent right here to my model. I can uh, drop that into the scene here and you see that's in a group. It's actually got three sections. And so if I jump into the front view here and I start moving this around, if I hold control, it will snap that with this turned on to uh, the part of the mesh that I need it to be in. And I can scale this down, move it into the place that I want it to be in. And then once I've got it in place, all I have to do is um, I've got my original uh, selected. I've got this selected uh, for my original mesh. And then I just hit this merge button and it will automatically cut out a uh, hole for this to sit into in the model. And then it will actually place the model for me into place uh, in the mesh. And so this comes with materials saved as well. And so these are all um, applied. If you select the original, you can see all of those there. So they're really basic materials, but they're 
at least a way to get started and quickly block meshes in. And if you're into doing robot design or anything like that, this is a super quick way to get things in. And what I like about it is that um, with Blender's built-in uh, projection technology, it will allow you to place stuff on any surface and any angle. So if we insert uh, something else, maybe we take this lens or this right here and we pull that in and then I want to project it onto this angular surface here. I can scale this into place really quickly, get it projected into approximate place, and then just all I have to do is merge, and then bam, like it's in place. All done for me. I can set up a camera and a light real quickly, and it's already ready to render. I don't have to do anything else. And so for prototyping stuff really, really fast, this is a super quick way to uh, drop stuff in. And um, yeah, so I have a lot left to learn. There's a lot more always to learn, but hard ops is an incredible tool for getting stuff like this done quickly. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I know that was really quick and a lot to take in at the very last uh, part of the stream, but it is a fantastic tool. Uh, so check that out on blendermarket.com. As always, I uh, want you guys to check out the Orange Guilds. You can follow a link in the description tonight and get your first month at theorangeguild.com for free. After that, it's only $9 a month. Uh, so if we head on over to the Orange Guild, uh, you can jump to the front homepage right here, click on Explore Your Training, and you can see uh, some of the things that we offer right here, as well as a breakdown for your monthly fee or your uh, one-time payment of $99 a year. After that, you're gonna see a little bit about me that you can read right here, and then the courses that we are currently offering. Uh, so definitely duck in here, check this out, and I would love to have you guys inside the guild uh, providing me with a little bit of uh, feedback on how we're doing and learning from some of the courses that we have up. And as always, I'm uh, gearing up to create more and more content for you guys. So. Uh, that can only happen if you guys jump on board and uh, you take uh, the courses and talk to me. So there we go. I'm also working on a new blog that will be coming out soon. And uh, yeah, maybe tomorrow I'll jump in and give you guys a free preview of uh, some of the content for the ebook that's coming out soon. But uh, until then, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the stream tonight. And I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to jump in, talk about UV mapping and Blender a little bit more. Uh, we're going to possibly get into Substance, talk about texturing there, maybe do some hand-painted texturing stuff in Photoshop. We talked about aging a little bit tonight in terms of the scene, and we need to talk a little bit more about how we're going to get in there and age some of these models up. So we're going to do that, and then Friday, who knows? Who knows what we're going to do? Uh, show up and find out. And as always, if you have any suggestions or you want to talk about uh, topics to learn about, feel free to leave me a comment in the chat or below this video if you're watching later. And I read every comment, I respond to every comment, and so uh, definitely leave me a message. So until then, you guys have a good evening. I'm gonna go get some dinner, and uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Central, uh, my time. So uh, yeah, come back and see me tomorrow. Thanks guys.